Well, I have the distinct honor of introducing Mike Wise, um, who's been, our, who is a phenomenal pegmatite expert and has been a researcher at the Smithsonian Institute uh, for more than 35 years. Um, I have known Mike for more than 45 years, which sort of ages us, <laughs> um, from our days as an undergrad at, at UVA, as has Mary Pat Gallia um, Haney, who is on, on with us tonight also. Um, we were in mineralogy class together, petrology, optical mineralogy under Dr. Richard Mitchell, um, who also edited the Rocks and Minerals magazine. And we, uh, three of us from UVA, went on to Lehigh University's summer field camp after we graduated. Um, and Mike was, his very first published paper was as an undergraduate on blue quartz um, for Rocks and Minerals um, magazine, a journal. Uh, he was such an expert, even as an undergraduate in identifying minerals, that during our Lehigh University field camp, both the students and the professors came up to Mike uh, to help for help with identifying uh, ham specimens that were found in the field. Uh, so he's always been phenomenal. He is uh, a native of Smithfield, Virginia. He is a rabid basketball fan and a pretty decent basketball player as well. Uh, go, go who's, <laughs> go who's. You, used to be a good uh, basketball player. <laughs> oh, you still are. <laughs> it's, okay, it's fine. And then um, uh, he worked briefly, I believe, for the Virginia Division of Mineral Resources before coming to this, uh, before going to graduate school in Canada at the University of Manitoba. And his advisor was so impressed with his field study uh, for his, he went for his master's, but his advisor convinced him that it was really dissertation worthy and he could go straight to his PhD. Um, another tribute to, to Mike's expertise. Um, so besides pegmatites at the Smithsonian, um, he was instrumental in creating the facsimile display of the Amelia Virginia uh, Moorfield mine that's that's on display for the Am Amazonite in the museum. And then most recently, uh, the new exhibit about minerals that are found uh, in the cell phone. Uh, he helped put that together. And that's phenomenal if you haven't seen it yet, if you haven't been to the Smithsonian. So he's a prolific researcher. If you've seen his publications list, He's a very dedicated educator, does, does great presentations for the kids in all ages, and he's an all-around great person. So I introduce um, Mike Wise. Thank you, Laura, for that very nice introduction. How much do I owe you for that? <laughs> uh, well, it's good to be here. Um, unfortunately, I wish we could all be together in person, but uh, maybe someday soon that will happen. I always enjoy speaking to the local clubs. Um, tonight, um, I'm going to talk pegmatites. How surprising. Those of you who know me know that I have a passion for these rocks. And tonight's subject, I'm hoping to convince everyone that pegmatites are the most exciting and the best rocks on the planet. So let's, let me share my screen here. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, just fine. Thanks, Mike. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so. Um, Full disclosure right off the bat, I love pegmatites. Um, and again, those of you who know me know this to be true. Um, as Laura mentioned, I've been studying these things for a long time, and I still don't understand everything that goes on about them. But tonight, I want to share with you, hopefully, 
Uh, some of the little quirks about pegmatite that you might not be aware of and sort of give you a very simplified version of how some of us think these pegmatites form. So when we compare pegmatites with other rock types, and I've listed a few here that you might be familiar with, you'll note right away that many of these rocks are pretty mundane. They all kind of look alike. You know, sandstones all look kind of the same. They may be slightly different in color. Pumice all kind of look the same. Basalts are all dark rocks. Many of these rocks are fine grain textured rocks. And frankly, compared to pegmatites, they're kind of boring. And, you know, even though they do have a purpose, they are part of very large geological uh, structures. So like in these, in this Grand Canyon scene here, you might find sand, layered sandstones and shales and limestones. Granite bodies can form large plutons and batholiths. And metamorphic rocks show some of the deformation that might take place in the Earth's crust. But again, from a mineralogical point of view, many of these common rocks, if you will, are pretty simple. So pegmatites, on the other hand, what are they? Well, the word comes from the Greek meaning to bind together. And this is in reference to this intergrowth of quartz crystals and feldspar crystals. And this texture is often referred to as graphic granite. And you can see on this slide, you can imagine that this pattern of quartz rods shown here in gray and the feldspar shown here in white sometimes kind of reminds you of hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics. So in 1822, the French scientist René Haoui used this term as a synonym for pegmatites. So in his mind, in his world at that time, graphic granite meant pegmatites. And it wasn't until about 1845 did the term, was the term first used in its current form. So many of us think of pegmatites as a rock, but in the very strictest sense of the word, it's actually a textual term that describes igneous rocks that are coarse grain to gigantic grain size. Now in terms of their composition, their mineralogical composition that is, you can have granitic pegmatites, granodiuretic ones, tonalitic, all the way through gabbroic and cyanitics. But it's the granitic ones that are the most common in the Earth's crust. And these are the ones that we tend to gravitate toward as mineral collectors and research scientists. Some of the features of granitic pegmatites include leucocratic, or what we refer to as light color. And many pegmatites will either have a homogeneous so heterogeneous internal structure. In other words, the, the, the minerals are uniformly distributed in a homogeneous pegmatite, or we may see layered or zone features within heterogeneous or zone pegmatites. Also in these pegmatites, some of these textures can be extremely variable, and I will talk about that a little bit later. And some of them are enriched in rare elements. And this is one of the things that's really important if you're a mineral collector, because pegmatites, unlike many other types of rocks out there, whether they're igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, though whatever the process is that forms pegmatites can often lead to this concentration of these very, very rare elements and volatile components like water, fluorine, boron, and phosphorus. So what does a pegmatite look like? So outlined here in red is what I would refer to as maybe as a simple or typical or common, if there is such a thing, pegmatite. And you can see the rock hammer for scale. And you'll notice right away that the crystals are quite large. You know, this one is almost the size of the head of the rock hammer. And we got variable grain sizes throughout this body. It is very coarse grain compared to the rock that is being that is in place in. And so pegmatites, they are igneous. These are igneous textures we're looking at, and they are characterized by these large crystals. 
But I also want to point out in this slide, right in this region here, you notice that the grain sizes are actually much smaller than what we see here. And this is what I was referring to when I was giving you the definition that the grain, the grain size in pigmentites can be quite variable. They can range from very large crystals down to small crystals. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So pigmentites can be used in a wide number of range things. Um, this example of quote unquote granite is not granite at all. In fact, it is pegmatite. It is marketed as granite, but if you were to look at the actual grain sizes of these white crystals here, these are actually graphic granite or, or graphic microcline crystals. And these long black blades are probably muscovite or either biotite. So even though the industry calls this granite, rest assured, this is actually a pegmatite. And so if any of you have some of this type of rocks in your kitchen, I would say, take a look at it. You got pegmatites in your kitchen. Um, but there are certain minerals that can be used in other applications. For example, quartz is used in the uh, for making solar panels and semiconductors and fiber optic cables. Feldspars have long been important ingredients in the ceramic industry. Uh, tantalite or columbite and tantalite. Uh, tantalum is a metal that is found in that mineral and it has a wide variety of industrial uses, particularly in electronics. So those of you, those of us who use cell phones and computers or even play video games, those Electronic devices require tantalum to, to make the capacitors, and that tantalum comes primarily from columbite tantalite, which are found in pegmatites. And of course, most recently, all the rage is now on the mineral, the element lithium. Spodumene is the dominant lithium ore in pegmatites. There are a few other lithium minerals that can occur in some pegmatites, and lithium is used for lithium ion batteries that are used in rechargeable portable electronics and in electronic vehicles. But you can also use pegmatite minerals in jewelry and lapidary equipment, lapidary materials. Um, so if those of you who have been to the museum, you've seen the Don Pedro. It is arguably the largest faceted aquamarine uh, that we know of. And it was cut from this large crystal that was discovered in Brazil. Many of you know a number of gem minerals, aquamarine, goshenite, emerald, heliodor, morganite. Those are all gem varieties of beryl, and they are primarily found in granitic pegmatites. Topaz is common gem minerals from pegmatites, and certainly elbite, as far as I know, it always comes from granitic pegmatites. So pegmatites are a great source of gem materials, but not just the common ones. Here are a few examples of some rare minerals that have been fastened into gemstones. So things like herderite, which is a beryllium phosphate, trifolite, a lithium phosphate, as is ambligonite. These minerals can be very common and very fairly abundant in certain granitic pegmatites. And on you know some occasion are jimmy enough to cut gemstones. And I always like to point out that all of these gemstones are much, much rarer than diamonds. So people out there who think diamonds are the end all gem minerals need to re rethink that. So where do we find pegmatites? Well, they occur all over the world and they occur primarily in the upper crust of the earth. So on every continent, even Antarctica, there are granitic pegmatites present. Generally speaking, within any given area, pegmatites rarely, if ever, occur as a single isolated body. In other words, they generally occur in groups of tens to hundreds. And in this slide, I'm showing you an image of an area that I worked in in Southern California. It is the Hakama pegmatite field. And off in the distance, you can see this large granitic body, which we are hypothesizing that, that may be the parent to these pegmatites. 
But in any case, all of these little squiggly thin lines are individual pegmatite dikes. And there are well over a thousand within a couple of square mile area. So this is typical for most um, large pegmatite fields. And so that would include thing, places like Maine or San Diego County or Minas Gerais, Brazil. Um, all of these places, you rarely find single pegmatite bodies. They're always occurring as a part of a pegmatite field or district. So the next part of my talk will focus on how we make a pegmatite. And it is an extremely complex process, um, which I don't have time to go into. And I, to be honest, I don't understand all of it. But I'm going to try to give you a very oversimplified version of how we get to make a pegmatite. And it all starts with a melt. All right, we have to have some molten rock. This is the beginning stages of what we end up here, these extremely cool rocks that we call pegmatites. And so it starts with the crystallization of rock forming minerals. All right, and so that means we're going to take this melt, we're going to crystallize and grow quartz, primarily quartz, microcline, feldspar, and albite. And at some point, we begin to crystallize rare element minerals, things like beryl and elbowite and shore, the members of the tourmaline group, and tantalite and spodumene, the lithium minerals. And all of this takes place as the melt is cooling or under the condition of decrease in temperature. And again, keep in mind, this is overly simplified because there's other factors that go into the creation or the generation of a pegmatite. So there's two models currently um, in vogue, if you will, for the genesis of a pegmatite. The first one, and, and perhaps the most commonly used, is this that pegmatites are the end result of granite crystallization. And so by that, we means we, we start out with this molten rock. It's at depth and it cools slowly and it begins to slowly crystallize quartz and feldspar and, and other the minerals that make up a normal, typical run-of-the-mill biotite or biotite plus muscovite granite. But at the very last stages of granite crystallization, we are left with this melt that's extremely water rich. It's still a silicate melt, but the water that was dissolved in this melt is now concentrated. And so we have something that's now is quite fluid, quite almost like a, not quite like water, but somewhere in between a melt and a liquid. And it's also this liquid or this melt is enriched or concentrated with all these other elements that I'll talk about a little later. The other um, hypothesis for forming pegmatites that's now being widely accepted, although it's quite difficult to prove, is that pegmatites can form from the direct crystallization of partially melting metamorphic rock. So in other words, we take a metamorphic rock, we melt it, and that melt crystallizes directly to a pegmatite. It doesn't go through this granite intermediate phase. Um, and so those are the two um, models un under which pegmatites, we think pegmatites form. And each of them have their pros and cons. The tricky part is figuring out how you can enrich certain melts in these rare elements that produce these wonderful minerals like beryl and spodumene and elbite tourmalines. So we need to generate some melt. And there are really sort of three tectonic settings in which melt is generated. And, and they occur in the lower to middle crust. You have regions where the continents are colliding in collision zones. And as the crust thickens, it temperatures and high pressures will actually melt the surrounding rock and we form melt, which can then migrate up as diapirs and, and accumulate to, and hopefully under the right conditions, uh, begin to form a granitic body. Or if we are 
uh, in a subduction region where we're colliding continental crust and oceanic crust, where the oceanic crust is subduction or pushed down, we can get melting taking place here. And because this melt is much more buoyant than the surrounding lithosphere, it will rise up into the lower to middle crust, where again, it will eventually cool and may form a granitic body if the composition of that melt is, is the right type of composition. And in the third scenario, we can generate melt uh, in rift zones where the crust is pulling apart. And here we actually get melts that have a little bit of a mantle signature. And so the granite composition, if these are the composition of the melt that's gonna form pegmatite, are slightly different than what we see in those that form here and here. But in essence, these are the three ways that we can uh, generate melt and ultimately generate a granite body, which then hopefully will produce granitic pegmatites. The evidence that pegmatites are related or can be related to granites are numerous around the world. Here's an example from a, a place in Rhode Island. Um, this is part of a smaller pluton, and you can see patches of what looks to be very coarse material. So we have fine grain granite intermingled by coarse grain pegmatitic material. And here's a close up of, the, of one of those pegmatitic regions. And you can see that the gradation from the fine grain granite is pretty uh, gradual for the most part. In some cases, it's kind of sharp, but this is some of the evidence that we uh, feel that this particular pegmatite body was formed as a residual melt of the crystallization of this granitic body. On the other hand, in an anatectic process, we see here in this example from Massachusetts, this metamorphic rock, this is a nice texture, and it has melted and it's formed, the melt has uh, accumulated to form these veinlets of pegmatitic material. And it's that's just not reserved for these schistose metamorphic rocks, but it also takes place in amphibolitic rocks. Um, I had a chance to visit this place, uh, this outcrop in Norway a few years back. And I was not a great believer in uh, pegmatites forming from anatectic processes, that is the melting of other rocks, but it was pretty convincing evidence after staring at this for about 20 minutes that, yeah, these pegmatitic features or these blebs and veinless are a result of this melting of this amphibolite. And if you were able to see this close up, you can clearly see that these are very coarse grain rocks that are uh, in this light colored material here. So we have our melt, we crystallize rock forming minerals. Now there's a consequence to this. So when we crystallize our quartz and feldspars, there are other elements in this melt like water and beryllium and boron and lithium and cesium. And when you crystallize quartz and feldspars, those elements normally will not go into quartz and feldspar structures. The structure just will not accommodate them at all, or it will accommodate only small amounts of that at the parts per million level. And so what happens is that the remaining melt becomes concentrated in water in these rare elements. Now, the consequence of that is that it tends to lower the viscosity of the melt. And now the melt can now travel from its site where it was formed and move upward into the upper levels of the crust. And in any system where we think granites are producing pegmatites, these pegmatitic melts will generally travel roughly three or so, three to five kilometers away from the parental granite unless there's some structural uh, conduit like a fault or a shear zone in which the melts can travel, might travel even further. But it's the, it's the lower melt viscosity that allows these melt to move from the site of the crystallization of the melt, the granite body, to its final resting place. And so we see then different shapes 
and attitudes of the pegmatites, and this is all a function of the surrounding rock in which the melt is in place. If the rock is fairly brittle, we tend to get linear bodies like these, the vertical dikes. Or if the rock is kind of plastic, we get wavy, boutonnage sort of things, pinch and swell features within the pegmatite dikes. Now, another consequence of this concentration of these water and rail elements is the development of these pe pegmatitic textures. And now the fun begins because now we see what's one of the things that sets pegmatites apart from other igneous rocks. And as I mentioned earlier, pegmatites are defined by their coarse grain nature and highly variable textures. And so one of the big things that really jumps out at us is the large crystal size. So here's an example of uh, a pair of smoky, smoky citrine cores. This is in our, our mineral gallery. And I would say for a pegmatite, this is kind of on the small side of things. This is a single twin feldspar crystal from the Himalaya mine. It, the pocket, it took up most of the pocket actually that it occurred in. And you've seen these in our gem gallery as well. These are two fairly large topaz crystals with the American golden topaz gemstone here, almost 23,000 carats. And only in pegmatites can you grow crystals this size and get gem uh, cut faster than stones of this size. And then they get, can get bigger. This is the famous rocket, an elbite from Brazil, a large smoky quartz from one of the Pikes Peak pegmatites in uh, Colorado, a nearly 20 foot long microcline crystal, because a uh, person for scale. This is at the Tanko pegmatite in southeastern Manitoba. And there are pegmatites in South Dakota that grew spodumene crystals approaching 50, 50, um, 50 feet in length. So again, if we were to compare just the crystal size or the grain size from, of pegmatites versus other rocks, igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, none of them can compete with pegmatites. But it's not just the large crystals that we can find in pegmatites. We can also find tiny crystals, sometimes right next to these giant crystals. And here's two examples. This is a rock we would refer to as aplite. It is extremely fine grain. It is made primarily of quartz and albite and maybe some very, very fine grain micas and little tiny blebs of shoral. Here's a penny for scale, just to give you an idea how fine grain these rocks are. This is from, this is an aplytic body that was in the central part of the Bennett pegmatite up in Maine. And here's a fine grain lapidolite mass from the Stewart pegmatite in the Palo District of Southeastern, uh, excuse me, of Southern California. And here's a lit camera lens cap for scale. So pegmatites, even though they're known for giant crystals, can also have these tiny, tiny, small crystals. And this is what I mean by this variable grain sizes that can occur in some pegmatite bodies. In terms of their um, internal structure, we have unzoned pegmatite or pegmatites with uniform grain size and mineralogy throughout the pegmatite, or at least most of it. And then we have zone pegmatites. Here's an example of a zone pegmatite from uh, the Topsom area in Maine. Uh, we have the granite body in which the pegmatite is intruded. There is zone one highlighted by yellow, zone two here in blue, zone three over on this side, and zone four. And you can notice right away that the zoning is asymmetrical. In other words, there's no zone three over this side, there's no zone two. And the other thing I want to point out is that the grain size of the zone pegmatite increases from the margins towards the middle. And this is very common in zone pegmatites. We believe that zone pegmatites generally crystallize from the margins inward. And this reflects a change in the chemistry, a change in the water content as the temperature is dropping and the pegmatite 
cooled and crystallizes. Some of the other textures that we run into in pegmatites, uh, we've already seen an image of the graphic texture where we have uh, this intergrowth of microcline and quartz. But we can have this, what I like to refer to as pseudo or quasi-graphic texture. This is an example of uh, intergrowth of quartz and black tourmaline or shoral. We have what's referred to as a comb structure where we have elongated minerals that grow perpendicular or nearly perpendicular to its contact. This is an image from the Himalaya mine. It intrudes this gabbroic rock shown in black. And at the contact, we had shoral nucleating and growing inward towards the center. And quite often what we'll find is that these crystals, they tend to flare out from the contact towards the center. And even though you can't see it in this particular slide or this particular image, in other parts of this mine, the composition of this tourmaline changes from black shoal to pink elbite as you approach the lithium-rich zone in the core of the pegmatite. Uh, down in this image, we have comb-structured muscovite crystals from the Michelode pegmatite in Colorado. And in this particular example, we see the muscovite is actually growing perpendicular to a fracture that occurred in the middle of the pegmatite. So in this particular example, the muscovite did not start nucleating at the contact, but from this fracture zone that, uh, that was found in the, near the core of the peg. And finally, we have layered textures. Um, this is again from the Palos um, district in Southern California. We have these millimeter scale layers of dark red garnet and alternating with white uh, layers that are, that are composed of albite and quartz. And in the Ramona district at the little three pegmatite, we have layered textures in the pegmatite, but the layering is due to shoral alternating with albite and quartz as opposed to the garnet layers. And locally, these are often referred to as line rock because they make up these very thin lines within the pegmatite. You can see in this example here in the little three, at least in Southern California and a few other places around the world, this line rock often is found in the foot wall part of the pegmatite. So we'll have coarse grain pegmatite in the hanging wall, uh, line rock in the foot wall. And this was often an indicator of the pocket pointing to the pocket zone in these pegs, which sort of lies somewhere in between the two, right about in here. But this doesn't, uh, this doesn't hold true for all pegmatites around the world. Um, so in the Rincon area, just sort of to summarize some of these textures, um, this is a pegmatite, Kathy Brown, who was my research assistant at the time. We were looking at a pegmatite in the Rincon area, which is just to the northeast of the Pala district. And Tim Rose actually sliced, cut a slice of this material that we brought back for us. And it illustrates very nicely the variation in texture you can get in a single dike. This dike is only about a meter at, at best in thickness. And we go from granitic texture at the contacts, moving into graphic feldspars here. You lose the graphic texture at the edges of the feldspar crystals. We have a quartz core, which if it had developed pockets would have occurred right here. And from the foot wall moving up, we have our massive all bite fine grain material graded into line rock or layered pegmatite. And you can't make it out really well, but we also have some very coarse feldspar, graphic feldspars right here, but they're very chaotic. They're almost brecciated in places. And then we have just silliness here where we get this mixture of graphic and brecciated and line rock all sort of intermingling here. So whatever was going on, you can see that it was a very, very complex um, sequence of events to form this meter thick pegmatite. And you can imagine what might go on in a pegmatite that's 100 feet thick. So let's move to the mineralogy. And this is what mineral collectors are all 
all in for when they when they want to go out and look at a pegmatite and collect. It is the mineralogy that really sets them apart from a lot of other common rock types, if you will. There are nearly 500 different mineral species that we know of that can occur from pegmatites. The silicates, phosphates, and oxides, they dominate over all the other mineral groups. But we do see sulfides, we do see borates, we do get carbonates. They're uncommon, but they do show up. This um, periodic table, I refer to as the pegmatology periodic table, all the elements that are not blocked out can be found in abundance in pegmatites. Okay? So I challenge anybody to show me a sandstone or a, um, a nice or an obsidian that's enriched in niobium and tantalum that will produce columbite tantalites. I mean, yeah, okay, there's the oddball thing like the rhyolites at, in Wild Wild Mountains in Utah, which has red barrel and bixite. I actually think of them as failed pegmatites, to be honest. But most rocks don't concentrate elements of this magnitude. Here I am sort of taking a break from all of this. This is the most, one of the more recent discoveries in Maine. This is the Palermo, uh, excuse me, not Palermo, Plumbago North. It is arguably one of the pegmatites of the largest spodumines to be found in that part of Maine. Um, and it's just to show you that pegmatites can be enriched in lithium and cesium and phosphorus and all these other wonderful rare elements, again, that most other rock types can't and don't concentrate. Some of you may be familiar with the Moorfield mine close to home. Again, the Moorfield has its mineralogy because it's it enriched fluorine and lead and titanium and scandium and all of these rare earth elements um, to produce things like the Amazonite, the Zenwaldite, and the Topaz. And it's a different composition of a melt from what we see in, say, the pegmatites in Maine. So for granitic pegmatites in general, the fundamental rock minerals are quartz and feldspars, all right? Pretty straightforward. And the muscov the micas are muscovite and anite or biotite. We get accessory garnets, apatites, and zircons. And, and you know, these are fairly common accessory phases in many pegmatites around the world. But what happens if we, as this quartz grows and it traps fluid inclusion, we get milky quartz. Or under conditions of natural radiation, we develop smoky quartz. And if the quartz has iron in its structure and also subjected to natural radiation, we develop amethyst. We generally don't think of amethyst in pegmatites, but there are a number of localities around the world where amethyst is fairly common in granitic pegmatites. We have them in Maine. We have some up in Montana, in the um, Bozeman area. And if, if the quartz just happens to have manganese in this structure or some phosphorus or traps inclusions of this demordiorite like fibers, we develop rose quartz. And so you can see quartz, even though it is probably the second most abundant, if not the most abundant mineral in granitic pegmatite, can come in a wide variety of types. The microcline as well. If iron is in the structure or hematite inclusion, we can change the color of, from tan and white microclines to these reddish microclines. Or in the presence of lead trapped into the structure of microcline, you add a little bit of hydroxyl or water, a little bit of natural radiation, we develop amazonite. Now, what I'm basically setting the stage here is that just based on different varieties of these two common minerals, we can learn a lot about what was going on in the development of the pegmatite as it was crystallizing. Muscovite is the most common mica in pegmatites, but as the lithium concentration increases in the melt, we move from muscovite to lithium muscovite, 
or lipidolite. All right. Now, as a cautionary note, we have these sort of pinkish micas that people have just assumed to be muscovite, or excuse me, lipidolite. In fact, most of them don't have enough lithium in them to be considered lipidolite. And actually, they are rose muscovites, which get their coloring due to the presence of iron and not lithium. Lithium is not a chromophore for any of these minerals that we're talking about. So let's talk more about chromophores, barrels. The barrel, ideally, the composition is that it is a beryllium aluminum silicate. BEAL 3 si 206 or 18, sorry. And so ideally it would be colorless or white. Goshenite, for example. But you add a little bit of iron to it, iron 2 plus, the color changes to blue. Iron 3 plus, we get yellows, shades of yellows and green, heliodores. And depending upon the ratios of Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, we get various shades of light green, aka common barrel, if you will. In the presence of manganese in the structure, we get heliodorous. Now, emeralds, which although are normally not found in pegmatites, occur as a result of pegmatite-related processes in some cases. So to make an emerald, you have to have both beryllium and chromium. And chromium is one of those elements that generally isn't found in pegmatite melts. But as the pegmatite melts intrudes ultramafic rocks or mafic rocks, it may extract chromium from the host rock, intermingle with the beryllium in the pegmatite, and the, an emerald may develop near the contact of the pegmatite and the country rock. So seeing emerald in a pegmatite, you can automatically make some inferences about what was happening in terms of the interplay of fluids between the pegmatite and the host rock that it's sitting in. If you've been to the Crabtree Emerald Mine in uh, the Spruce Pine area in North Carolina, that's exactly what took place. And that's why we get emerald associated with that pegmatite body. Tourmalines. We all know and seen the various colors of tourmalines. And again, it goes back to the chemistry. In this particular example from the Himalaya mine, this was a tricolor tourmaline. The root, if you will, of the tourmaline was black. So it's a shoral and it graded to elbaite, green elbaite and pink elbaite or the, the varieties vertolite and rubolite. In this process or this change from shoral to elbaite, we're seeing basically an increase in the lithium concentration. So shoral is a lithium free tourmaline with iron and the elbaites are lithium enriched tourmaline and the pink gets its color due to manganese and the green will have various ratios of fe2 plus fe3 plus or even a little bit of manganese generally speaking the shoal crystallizes first in terms of this position in a pegmatite. So in other words, if we have multiple colors of elbaite in a pegmatite, the iron-rich phase crystallizes early. So we expect to see shoal first, and over time, gradually, as the iron is used up and the manganese becomes more enriched in the pegmatite melt, we typically get manganese phases late. So the elbaite will be formed late. However, pegmatites don't like to play nice and behave all the time. Because in the Tourmaline King Mine in Southern California and in other places around the world, we see manganese tourmalines forming early and iron tourmalines forming late. But regardless of which one occurred first or last, we can still deduce that the pink color is due to the presence of manganese, the dark colors, blues and blacks, occur to iron. And so you now begin to formulate in your mind how the melt or the pegmatite melt was evolving or changing with crystallization. Uh, I want to point out that we have a colorless band here and you might think, well, maybe there's no chromophore that's given color to that white band. Well, it turns out that actually 
manganese is enriched in there, but it's just not the right valence state of manganese. It's actually manganese three plus. I mean, excuse me. Yeah, manganese three plus and not manganese two plus. So color in certain accessory minerals can be a really useful tool in understanding some of the processes that take place with the pegmatite as it crystallizes, specifically the chemistry. So we can see in this little diagram I put together, several mineral species, muscovite, apatite, you've got garnets and tourmalines and whatnot. And you can see that if we look in this direction, these are the minerals that generally start crystallizing early to late. All right, so in increasing chemical complexity, if you will. If you go down the chart, we have you know, pretty much rock forming minerals, rock forming accessory phases. You start to get boron here, beryllium here, niobium and tantalum here, phosphorus enrichment here, and finally lithium enrichment as you move down. Moving from left to right, not in all cases, but in some, we are looking at changes in the iron to manganese ratio. So for uh, garnets, for example, almondine is an iron-rich garnet, spessartine is a manganese-rich garnet. Shoral is an iron-rich tourmaline. Elbaite, pink ones are manganese dominant. Then columbites, ferrocolumbites early, manganocolumbites late, and then trifolite, it's an iron lithium phosphate, lithiophyte, some manganese lithium phosphate. And so color, if you understand the connection between color and chemistry, you can begin to really start to decipher what's going on chemically from a particular pegmatite. And if you see these particular minerals with changing in color with the zoning patterns of a zone pegmatite, then you really begin to understand the pro some of the processes that are taking place. So I've shown you some of the common minerals, and now let's look at a few of the uncommon things, things that you normally don't think about when we think about pegmatites. And right off the bat, it's carbonates. This is the specimen I referred to that one of our donors has acquired for us. It's from a pegmatite in Pakistan, as I mentioned, it's almost 11 uh, centimeters in this direction. And it is doubly terminated, twinned. It's got a little shore crystals growing in it. And it is an amazing thing. First of all, carbonates are rare in pegmatites. Rhodochrosite is the rare, one of the rarest of them. We do get siderites over here in Namibia. These are actually disc-shaped siderite crystals. They're now gertite after siderite. But carbonates are not common. And to get one this size, Jimmy Rotocrosite is just unheard of. Um, when I found out that this donor was getting this for us, I was actually literally dancing in the aisles in the convention center. It's a wonderful thing. Epidote. We usually think of epidote as a metamorphic phase, but there are a number of pegmatites around the world where epidote is quite common. And it's not forming by metamorphic process. It's actually primary epidote forming in pockets. Monazite is one of the more common rare earth bearing minerals. It's a rare earth phosphate. But then let's move to zeolites, lomatite, chabazite, those still bite, calcium aluminum silicates. You don't really associate zeolites with pegmatites very often. These two phases are cesium rich. We have a cesium borate in Londonite and it's associated mineral rhodazite. And then cesium beryllium lithium aluminum silicate, pezotoite, which is a member of the beryl family. Again, these are really, really rare. And it's just amazing that you have cesium enrichment with, bor with a borate of all things. Uh, most of the boron and pegmatites are typically tied up in making tourmalines, much less these idiotic things. And then we have urmiabite, an aluminum borate with fluorine. So in other words, pegmatites can produce some really interesting and bizarre things due to this nature of its unusual chemistry. Again, chemistry that you normally don't see 
occurring in other rock types. So going back to our how we make a pegmatite diagram, once we have this concentration of rare elements, we can then crystallize all these rare earth, rare earth minerals. But it comes at a price. As soon as you start crystallizing out tourmalines and tantalites and polyacites, you then deplete the residual melt of these rare elements, and that then reduces any water that was dissolved in it. So the solubility of water decreases. That means it cannot stay dissolved in the milk. It comes out or dissolves or unmixes, however you want to describe it. And we might form pockets. And pockets are what we all love because pockets are where you get the great mineral specimens like our famous candelabra. So here's an example of a pocket from a pegmatite in the Warsaw Pluton in Wisconsin. Pockets are natural voids or natural openings that develop within the pegmatites. Uh, there's actually a couple, another way you can develop pockets is due to uh, dissolution or, or corrosion within pre pegmatite that already crystallized. But generally speaking, these are primary features, the, one of the last gaps of pegmatite formations. Um, here I am reaching into a pocket in uh, Colorado, in the Pikes Peak area, and I was pulled that little guy out. They named this the Smithsonian Pocket, but unfortunately they didn't let us keep the specimen. But in any case, uh, you can see that uh, this is a very fine specimen of Amazonite Smoky Quartz, and it hasn't even been cleaned yet. And I actually saw this specimen once they cleaned it and prepped it at uh, Tucson uh, about two years afterward, and it was selling for like $10,000. Um, so anyway, but myolytic pegmatites or pocket pegmatites are extremely rare. So in all the pegmatites that we know that occur on the planet, myolytic or pocket pegmatites represent less than 1% of all known pegmatites. So it is a really, truly rare thing that happens and why some pegmatites develop pockets and some don't, well, we kind of think we have a handle on it. Typically, these pocket variant pegmatites occur at low pressures, one and a half to two kilobars. Once you get past that three kilobar pressure mark in the crust, pegmatites generally don't form uh, pockets, but it also got, has to have the right chemistry. So it's, it's not as simple as just the pressure conditions under which these myolytic cavities form. Here's a pocket I got to ex uh, excavate um, in the Himalaya mine. And in there, you can see all this dark red material is full of clay. And people like to think of that when they open to a pocket, it's nice, pristine, clean minerals. No, they're broken, they're fractured, they're lying in clay. Um, it's really quite a traumatic environment, and it's a wonder why we even get nice specimens out of them to begin with. And so here are a few examples of what can happen to minerals in a pocket. Um, this is in our exhibit. This is what we affectionately call the Don King tourmaline. It's a tourmaline that started out as shoal slash elbite in its early stages of growth, but at the very end, something went awry in the pocket and it dissolved, corroded, recrystallized, however you want to define it, into these series of hairy fibrous tourmalines. And each one of these little hairs is an individual crystals. And there are millions of them sitting perched on top of this non-corroded tourmaline. We get crystals that can be bent and healed so they fracture, and then some other mineral in, invades the fracture and reheals it, and so you end up with things that look appear to be bent. In this case, this particular elbowite is healed by uh, late stage albite, so it's just shown here in the white. And then here from the Himalaya mine, we, I'm showing you an example of several stages of etching or corrosion. This is a fairly pristine bicolored tourmaline. You can see here another tourmaline 
from an adjacent pocket, I believe, or it might even be the same pocket, but the pink is highly corroded. The green is a little bit less so. And then this example, the tourmaline was completely corroded, recrystallized. There's actually little fine colorless fibers on the tips of the pink tourmaline, and it was encased in a fine grain assemblage of uh, all bite quartz and tourmaline. And all of this occurs in a pocket. So again, the, the pocket environment, even though it can produce some really fabulous and spectacular mineral specimen, is a really nasty environment for many minerals. And it's a wonder we ever do find great things out of pegmatite pockets. Now, if we don't find pockets, what happens to this fluid? Well, this dissolved water that also has other elements in it, mind you, can do other things. It can leave the pegmatite, it can alter the surrounding country rock, or the pegmatite can just stew in its own juices and alter it. And so we see things like feldspars being altered to clays like montmorillonite or kaolinite, or things like spodumene being altered to cookite or tourmaline has been altered to cookite, which is another lithium mica, or the entire pegmatite being kaolinized due to both the combination of effects of weathering and fluids migrating through the pegmatite. Um, there's another example of elbaite crystals that were replaced by lithium micas and clays. Oops, sorry, got ahead of myself. And over here, we have an example of microcline being replaced by epidote and quartz, fine grained epidote and quartz. And so alteration plays a big, big role in the mineralogy that we see in many pegmatites, particularly the complex one. So as an example, we can take a pristine barrel and then depending upon the pH of the fluid, we can end up with a number of different mineral assemblages. So bertrandite, euclase, and phenakite may occur in barrel pegmatites where the pH of that late fluid is four to five. Or if, if it's a fairly neutral system, bertrandite may form with feldspars and micas. And under very alkaline conditions, we might get epididymite or eudidymite, similar to some of the minerals that you find in the Mont Saint Hilaire pegmatites up in uh, Quebec. So to finish this up, I know I've probably gone a little old, lot longer than I'd like to. I want to leave you with the ten commandments of pegmatites that everyone should follow because pegmatites are indeed the most amazing rocks on the planet. First and foremost, thou shalt not worship any other rocks before pegmatites. I honestly live by that, and you should too. Forget not the common and simple pegmatites, for there are many. As I said, these are the most abundant ones. These rare element pegmatites with spodumene and beryl and amazonite, those are the oddball ones. Most of the pegmatites around the world don't have that mineralogy. Thou shalt not defile or desecrate any pegmatites. This is just wrong. Ignore not the rare black minerals because without them, you have no electronics. And I don't stress this enough. Tantalite, we all use cell phones on a regular basis without tantalum, which comes from tantalite, our cell phones would be useless. Simply say, quartz is good. This is when I had to learn the hard way. And over years, I've grown to accept the unexpected because just when you think you've got a pegmatite figured out, you see textures or mineralogy that you go, this doesn't belong here. Why is it here? I can't explain it. And you just sort of walk away scratching your head. Fear not the strange with understanding from great enlightenment. So three examples here that I want to share. Opal. We don't think of opal in pegmatites, but highlight opal does occur in many localities in a specific type of pegmatites. And they are don't, or the opal here generally is not as fierce. In this particular example from the Orongo Mountains, they are. But in other places around the world, we don't see spherical opals. And so so we don't get to play a colors. 
Fine scale zoning is very common in many pegmatites, particularly in columbite tantalites. You could have a the major part of your pegmatite, your, your columbite or tantalite completely unzoned, and then at the very tail end, we get this chaotic zoning patterns, which shows this rapid change in both iron and manganese ratio and niobium and tantalum. And you can see from this slide that there's really no rhyme or reason to why that, that you can explain this easily. And then zircons, corroded zircons. We've looked at many zircons in pegmatites, and they, even though they may have pristine crystal morphologies, the interior of them are just shot. They're just a mess. And personally speaking, I don't know how, how anybody could rely on a age determination of a pegmatite based on analyzing zircon. Remember the pocket pegmatites for they are holy. Honor thy parental source. So if you've been to the South Dakota, see Mount Rushmore, even seen pictures, the Mount Rushmore is carved out of the Harney Peak granite, which is believed to be the source of all of those wonderful pegmatites like the Etta, Ten Mountain, Helen Barrel pegmatites there. And so we believe, or well, some of us at least believe, that the Harney Peak granite intruded the surrounding metal sets and spawned off hundreds of pegmatite dikes. And you can actually see some of these dikes as white veinlets that are cross-cutting many of the president's faces. And the final, uh, ten, final commandment of pegmatology that I want to leave you with is Pegmatite's rule. And thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry that I went overboard there, but thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. That was fabulous, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> sorry, I just the <laughs> 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 Let's see, moved. She did. Mm -hmm. So yes. I'm going to yes. uh, jump in and uh, show off to Mike. Well, I need to get where I can see it so that I can even see if it's coming across. Like a we, we see it. It's it a drip. I, I can't see it. If I can't see it, I can, you see, it. I can see half of it. Up Looks or down? Good. There you go. You got it. Yeah. So it's a dravite. And, but look at the top of that thing, just as you described. Yeah. yeah. You sure it's a Dravite? Has it been analyzed? Oh, listen, Mike, this is Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying by you, but I will, let me say this about Dravite, though, Dave. So Dravite is not the tourmaline species you would normally find in pegmatites, but it can occur. And if it does occur, it will often occur near the margins because we think that it's the pegmatite melt is drawing magnesium from the country rock. Now, if that's a pocket one, and that truly is a is a dravite composition, then that really implies there's some really nutty things going on in the chemistry in that pocket environment. Because magnesium should have already been used up, if there at all, to begin with. And you shouldn't you shouldn't find dravites in pegmatite pockets. Yeah. Where is it from? Where's the locality? Uh, Tanzania. Oh, uh, M-W-A-J-A-N-G-A. -A -A. You say it. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> sure, it's a Thank pegmatite you. now and not something else. Nope, nope. I, I, I have the label that it was bought with, and uh, that's as brilliant as I'm ever going to be. Okay. I need to go field trip to Tanzania then. I, but I think it's a pretty cool piece. And with you describing that one, by the way, as always, you do a phenomenal job. Thank you for the gift. Absolutely. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to get, get to Crabtree. Ah, yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, so you can see that most of the emeralds are right near the contact with the schist. Yeah, that's why I love this rock. Yeah, so... I actually, years ago, visiting, I actually found 
probably maybe six inches from the contact, a bicolored barrel. It was yellow, half yellow, half emerald. And I'd never run across that from the crab tree. You either get all emerald in a crystal or all yellow barrel. But I actually found one that was bicolored. And of course, I had to bring it home. It's in my office. <clears throat> Is the highlight opal at that locality uh, or like spruce pine? Is that the kind of opal you would find in um, pegmatites? Yeah. So spruce pine is well known for highlight opal, at least here in the States. And you get the blue ones, white, and you also get the sort of lightly, uh, light green. And um, I did a study years ago on the structure of these highlight opals because we, we, had, we had a postdoc um, who was with us and she was an opal expert and she looked at you know the normal opals and fire opals. They all have these little micro and nano spheres which cause us to play of colors. And I asked her, I said, have you ever looked at any highlight opals? And she goes, yeah, they have no, they have no structure. And I go, you haven't looked at pegmatitic ones yet, have you? So we looked at about a dozen localities and every single one had a different structure. None of them has spheres. Well, except for that one image I showed you, but the bulk of it, there was no spheres, which explains why you don't have to play a color, but we were seeing layered features. We were seeing brecciated features. I, I have one slide where you can see layers that were translucent so you can see the layers behind it. And I can't explain it for the life of me. But highlight opal is one of those minerals that I, I believe that is indicating a specific type of pegmatite composition. You don't normally find it in lithium pegs. You find it in pegmatites that are related to the rare earth bearing ones. So things that might have alanite in them, or like in the Irongos that have fluorite or topaz bearing ones. Um, so, and I don't know why that is the case because it's just wet silica. So it, sh it should be more common than it is. But I think a lot of people just overlook it or haven't looked for it. But it's a fun mineral. Uh, Mike, can you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the, the pockets and the gem minerals that that are formed in these pockets, like like the uh, steamboat and the and the candelabra, I understand that these rare earth elements gets con get concentrated in the melt in the end stages, and uh, somehow these minerals are formed uh, at the very end of the process. How long does it take these minerals to form? Is it thousands of years, hundreds of years, weeks or months? Uh, no, <laughs> it's quick. It's really quick. Um. So, first clarification, I use I threw out the term rare, da, 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 da. So when I say rare element, or where rare earth refers to the part of the periodic table where you have, you know, cerium, lanthanum, um, yttrium, I'm drawing a blank, those elements. Yeah. Rare, rare elements refer to all these other things like beryllium, lithium, um, boron, and so forth. So to answer the question about the time, the speed, um, pegmatites don't take long to crystallize, okay? And this was a revelation to me many years ago. I, you know, we're kind of taught in elementary or introductory geology that, that to grow a big crystal, you need a long period of geologic mm -hmm. time. So, you know, it takes millions of years to crystallize a granite, and those granite crystals are only a few millimeters. So if you're going to grow a a meter long barrel crystal, it should take, you know, 10 times that long, if not longer. But the reality is that it doesn't because the melt is so fluid, so water rich and full of all of these volatile components that it, it uh, changes the viscosity of the melt and allows for diffusion to rapidly occur. So elements can go from point A to point B in the blink of an eye and start crystal, start nucleation. And it's, once nucleation starts, if it's growing in a liquid as opposed to a melt, it just takes off. Um, a colleague of mine 
sent me a couple of videos, uh, some experiments he's doing in the lab, and he's growing, he was growing uh, a feldspar crystal. It's in a little capsule, mind you, but it was in a liquid, almost with the, with the viscosity of water. And I'm watching this thing grow on this video in less than 30 seconds. It was completely grown to about you know, a couple of microns. And so you extrapolate that to pegmatites, and there have been colleagues of mine who've done calculations that a meter thick pegmatite like the Himalaya mine could be could grow, crystallize, and be solid in a year. Wow. Or 10 years, depending upon the pressure, the temperature of the surrounding rocks, the composition of the melt or the, the, the medium. So yeah, it's a fast, fast, fast process. And now, does that same time frame apply to the, those etched crystals that you showed? Yeah, and so in the pocket, it's probably even just as fast, if not faster, because we believe or we think that in the pocket setting, it is completely liquid or liquid plus gas, but certainly not a, a melt, a thick melt. And so once the nucleation starts, it just it's just gonna go. Um, but at the same time, when you're growing a crystal or crystals of one composition, that crystal is now is no longer in equilibrium with the surrounding liquid. And so it could then attack, resorb, corrode that crystal. And when it does, it frees up those elements which make it, and then you can recrystallize. I mean, and things are just happening constantly. Wow. I mean, wow. yeah, it, it's it's again, it's really kind of amazing that you get anything of value or in a pocket. Um, it's still we still don't fully understand what's happening because every pocket's different, even within a single pegmatite. There have been, you know, I've seen the remnants of pockets, uh, like at the Bennett Quarry in Maine, three pockets, they're about a foot apart. The two outside pockets had pink barrel, the middle pocket had a colorless barrel. You know, there's, there's been pockets I've seen from Namibia, the Rongos, we have one back in the blue room. It's I've got topaz, beautiful topazes with muscovite and quartz and microcline showing a hint of amazonite. And then I saw another pocket, two more po pockets at Tucson this year from the same deposit. The mineralogy had no topaz, had am more amazonite and had shoral in them. So as in each pocket, you have to kind of think of it as its own little micro environment um, that, that behaves in its it does its own thing. That's all I can say. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey Mike. Um, so are those Herkimer diamonds? It, are those? I mean, I I know they're grown. They grow in packets, but are that is that a pegmatitic process as well? No, the Her Herkimer Herkimer material is not pegmatized. Pegmatites have to be of igneous origin. They have to have. Uh, okay at least feldspar and quartz. Uh, the Herkimer things are hydrothermal quartz veins, intruding limestone or marble or something to that effect. Oh, my. So, no, they're not pegmatites. Wouldn't be considered pegmatites. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mike, you've talked in the past that one of your favorite pegmatites is uh, Paraiba tourmaline. Uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? And do you have any other new favorites? <laughs> uh, new favorites, yeah. It, ch it changes daily almost. <laughs> so Pariba tourmaline, again, is one of these unique chemical situations <laughs> whereby you're getting a pegmatite melt or fluid or something of that nature that has copper in it. And copper generally is not found in pegmatite melts. So the question becomes, where does this copper come from? And if you look at the pegmatites, 
Well, I've only ones I've actually visited are in Brazil. I haven't seen the ones in Namibia. I mean, excuse me, Nigeria or Mozambique. But the ones in Brazil are intruding a sandstone. I mean, a quartzite. And the only copper mineralization are small bits of what looks like either calcopyrite or calcocite. So I hypothesize that, okay, maybe the pegmatite melt was fluids were sucking copper from those from that country rock and mixing with the melt. The melt had enough boron to make tourmalines. And um, the copper acts as a chromophore to cause that nice color that we love for Paraiba. Now, in the Quintos mine, also in Brazil, you have zone crystals that grade from shoral to uh, pink tourmalines to Paraiba blue caps or rims. And each one of those has copper in it, but the copper level increases as you go from the black to the to the blue. So Paraiba is a bit different. And again, so far we only know three localities in the world that produces Paraiba tourmalines. So it has to be a unique environment, much like getting emeralds in pegmatites where the pegmatite is melt is essentially contaminated so that we get these wonderful paraiba tourmalines. Uh, as far as my favorite things, as I say, it changes. When I went to Tucson, this rhodochrosite from Pakistan pegmatite has now become one of, one of my favorites, even though I haven't seen it. Just seeing the specimen is just makes me wonder why why that particular pigment that you got rhodochrosite and others don't. But I'm sure I'll find I, the ones soon. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like that, that first, that, that, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank and, you. Um, I, I had a couple questions. Um, you, you've already answered one of them, uh, had to do with uh, crystallization times. Um, my other question was, um, does it appear that that both the fractional crystallization and the anatexis uh, process uh, <clears throat> occur at, at, at different different localities to both produce pegmatites? So. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a really good question, Jeff. And uh, I'm too old to answer that because <laughs> it hasn't been it, 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 there are places where, um, where people have seen a group of pegmatites, there's a granite body present, and they kind of automatically say, all right, this particular granite probably produced these pegmatites. And then when they get ages done on both, they realize, oh, there's like a 50 million year gap here. So these pegmatites probably didn't come from this granite. So, okay, if they didn't come from the granite, they were probably form of anatectic processes. Well, okay, fine. But one of the issues with the model or the hypothesis of anatectic pegs is how do you form a spodumene or lithium-rich pegmatite by melting metasets? Because most of those metasets that were available, that were melted, probably were not enriched in lithium. And to take it one step further, if you have a spodumene peg that's also got barrel and tantalite and phosphates in it, what, what metamorphic rock has will have that composition or minerals with those elements that will then melt and then go into this melt to form a pegmatite of that nature? And so that's one of the problems with the anatectic model is resolving the chemistry of the precursor metamorphic rock or meta igneous rocks, whatever was melted, and the end result, pegmatite. Then you have situations where in a pegmatite field, people will say, oh, wait, there's two different ages of pegmatites here. There's a granite body here, two different ages of pegmatite. One of the groups of pegmatites is close to the age of the granite, the other one isn't. But they look really similar, the pegmatites look really similar. So prior to getting 
you know, ages on them, how do you tell which is which came from which? So um, there's more and more people starting to support the anatechnic model these days, thanks to my colleague Skip Simmons, who's causing all these problems for me. Um, but it's still a lot of work that needs to be done on what exactly is the parent or the source for pegmatites as a whole. Is it strictly granite? Is it strictly anatectic melts? Is it some combination of the two? Is it contamination? It, it varies, you know, it's, it's really hard to pin it down. Probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it seemed to me you, you kind of touched on some of the problems with the anatectic model earlier. So I was um, I'm thinking perhaps that occurs in some places, whereas the more traditional model occurs in other places and, or. Well, you know, yeah, or... yeah, there, there's, there's, no, there's no question that there are pegmatites that are related directly related to grants. I mean, if you look at the Pikes Peak material, for example, we have pegmatites sitting in the Pikes Peak Pluton with gradational contacts, and you see similar ages of the granite and the pegmatites, similar mineralogy of the granite. And, and you can, if you understand the whole fractional crystallization mechanism, you can see how this particular Pikes Peak granite can produce the variety of pegmatites that are within it and within the immediate margins of it. And I wish they all were like that, but unfortunately they're not. Well, that what that, that's part of what makes it fun. Yeah, to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> so I started pulling my hair out and go rocking. <laughs> Kathy, you had a question? Uh, well, actually, I, I need to compliment you, Mike. I mean, for the last 35 plus years, you've been so generous to our geology group and caring for us and educating us, making yourself available to us. And I have to thank you. I name dropped you, Laura Dwyer, and I years ago went to Amelia and we said, oh, we volunteer for Mike Wise. Oh. <laughs> and, and Kenny Reynolds was there too. We all had our hard hats. And so Mrs. Dunaway said, okay, the Smithsonian group, ready for you to go uh, in the mine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually had a, a chat with Sam yesterday. Uh, he's up in a meeting in Toronto right now, and I was calling to find out um, when when is he coming back and when is he going to pump out the mine because um, I don't know if you knew this, but he's looking to sell the Moorfield. And he's it's not that he's he doesn't want to sell it, but it's just, you know, it's at the point of his life that he can't keep doing it forever, and but he wants to sell it to someone who um, loves the Moorfield as much as he does, and not going to build a house on top of it. <laughs> and he there's a Martin Marietta quarry right next door to it, and he said he will not sell it to them because he knows what's going to happen. So um, I told him, I said, well, we need to then finish up any projects we would like to see done on the Moore field and get some stuff published as its last hurrah. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do within the next upcoming years. And uh, any help is greatly appreciated. <laughs> Because it's a lot of work. Could he sell it to the state of Virginia? They know about it. They could have bought it a long time ago if they wanted it, but they wouldn't want it because they would just sort of fill it in with concrete or something silly like that, or let it flood and close it off. It should. It's one of those localities, I believe, that should be preserved mm -hmm. because it is one of Virginia's few classic rural classic locality. As I mentioned this to Sam, I'm going, what other Amazonite pegmatite do you know of that you can that you can walk into and see a wall of green? I mean, I, I visited a couple of other ones. I mean, the, the Colorado stuff is just pockets. 
there's no place you can't walk into an Amazonite wall like you can to Moorfield. Um, I've been to the Zappot in Nevada, same thing there. There's Amazonite crystals that are really good quality, but nothing like the Moorfield in terms of just the sheer amount with big honking topaz crystals sitting in it. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I wish there was some way it was, it could be protected and preserved, much like the Harding pegmatite was bought by uh, University of New Mexico. So they own the Harding, which is a spodumene peg. And, you know, it's not an underground mine, but it's open for collectors and researchers. And I wish the Moorfield was, to get that gain, that status. So let's all play the lottery and uh, <laughs> win and buy it up and preserve it. Question, Mike. Uh, you, you've drawn the curtain back for us, get, you're showing us some of the aspects of how, how pegmatites are formed. But I'm curious about how a pegmatologist is formed. Uh, your work at Manitoba in the late 80s yeah. um, and Peter Zerny. Um, Charlie, yeah. yeah. Can you share, the, to what extent were you helped form by him? Um, because he kind of was the first person or at least a person who really classified pegmatites, apparently. Yeah, well, so actually this pegmatologist here actually drew inspiration from Dick Mitchell at UVA. He, uh, with our mineralogy class, he was talking about a number of things, blue quartz, one of them, but he, he started talking about pegmatites and he mentioned the Amelia County pegmatites, which just happened to be not too far from Smithfield. And so I thought, oh, I can swing by there on my way home visiting my family over the weekend. And I did. And I didn't know where I was going. And I ended up on the side of the road looking at a map trying to figure out where the hell am I. And I look out my window and on the ground there was some white rocks. And it was somebody um, all bite with with, uh, with uh, the microlite crystals in it. And that was my introduction to pegmatites. And while at UVA, um, Bob Meinzer, who was our teaching assistant, he went off, when he graduated, he went off to go to Manitoba to get his PhD. And he knew I had interest in getting one, uh, a, a graduate degree. And he wrote me and said, Peter was looking for a master's student to work on tantalite, combined tantalite in Northwest Territories. And he wrote in his letter, it was a three page handwritten letter. And he said, not many people have studied these minerals, but I know that something good would come out of this project. And I had the choice of going there, UNC in Chapel Hill and South Dakota School of Mines of all places to study pegmatites. Went to Manitoba, didn't know Peter from a hole in the ground. Get there, end up going to Northwest Territory. So I was thrown into the fire. And after you know, the first month of mosquitoes and black flies and getting acclimated, it was like, this is a whole different world. And I loved it. It, it because I had an interest in mineralogy and the pegmatite exposed me to a lot of minerals that I knew and that I didn't know of. And so it was that experience that got me really hooked on pegmatite in the Northwest Territories. And as much as I hate to admit it, I miss going up there. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Yes. That's Jim Hurd. Hey, Jim. Good talk. I, I've heard bits and pieces of this before, I think, at Wild Acres and a couple other places, but it's always interesting. Yep. Uh, a long, long time ago, I spent a lot of time in Bancroft, and mm -hmm. I was at the... Uh, Cardiff fluorite mine. You familiar with that? The which fluorite mine? Cardiff fluorite. Cardiff? Oh, uh, I've heard of. I've I've never been there. Okay, I don't know what it was, but we were digging out at that time called them spade crystals, which are titanites. 
Mm -hmm. and black, I guess, heavy iron because they were totally black. They weren't jemmy. But they occurred in like a melt pocket. It was weird. It was it was uh, fluorite with sphene sort of floating in it. And then above it was a massive uh, deposit of a, a dolomite material, which you couldn't hardly break with a chisel because it was just powder. And then it had uh, appetites floating in it. And I didn't, I have no idea what the morphology for that area was, whether it was, you know, a pegmatite I was digging in or, or what. Yeah. You said carbonates aren't normal, and this was definitely, a, you know, a massive carbonate. Yeah, it probably was dot. The mineralogy you described didn't sound right. And if I, if now that you mentioned the appetites, are those the jit, big, long, giant green, blue green appetites? Uh, these were red. To red. pink, okay. was it but they, they they weren't real large in that particular location, but they do have large ones up there, and they do have some green, some large green ones too, and they are found in this massive, uh, I I call it dolomite, a crystalline dolomite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to see some of the material read up on it. Doesn't sound like it though. I mean, you can get titanite in pegmatites. Um, I've seen them in Southern California. I had a great opportunity to, to see some in the Boulder Batholith in Montana a few years ago. Uh, you know, Titanite crystals, oh, yay big. <laughs> Not Jimmy, but they were brown to sort of honey color. Yeah. Um, and that was the same pegmatites that had amethyst in them too, so. Well, I, I guess that's me. still an unanswered question as to how that yeah. particular formation was formed. It was really weird because you could almost see it that, okay, the fluorite a lot of times was almost in a in a vesicle like bubble of fluorite floating and like it was floating down through and huddled up at the bottom of a of a pool, and then there was all these fiends mixed into the fluorite. Uh huh. Huh. It's really weird stuff. Sounds like it. <clears throat> and fun to collect. Yeah. Hey, Mike. I, again, uh, Craig. Hi, Craig. Uh, excellent presentation, as always. Um, and I think many of us, you know, couldn't agree with you more about, boy, you know, some the Moorfield mine some, needs to be saved some way. I mean, what a treasure that is. And, you know, for that, something to happen to that would just be a real loss. Um, question I had for you, and I know you touched on this and I just, I, I wasn't writing quite quick enough. What did you say causes the color of the periobo tourmalines? What was that primarily due to? The paraiba tourmalines? Yes. Copper. Copper. Okay, I did get that right. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thanks for an excellent presentation again. And as Kathy Rechta said, you know, you know, all the being such a good friend of the clubs, the way you have been to us for many years. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike, I have a quick question for you. Yes. You mentioned the Harding pegmatite. I know that was a big time source of strategic uh, minerals in World War II. Yeah. Miners were incentivized to go looking for strategic minerals. Uh, are there pegmatites today being mined for their strategic minerals? Or is it <laughs> mostly for collectors? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. You ever heard of the element lithium? <laughs> <laughs> you would not believe the lithium boom that's going on with pegmatites these days. In fact, I've been involved with a couple of projects collaborating with people at North Carolina State on developing uh, um, exploration guideline for finding lithium pegmatites. The Harding was mined mostly for tantalum, and that was supposed to be my pilgrimage pegmatite. I have, still haven't made it there yet. But today, it's all about lithium, and, and there are companies staking lithium pegmatites like crazy. Um, I'm hoping to go up to South Dakota, hopefully in April, 
to go look at some of these things. I've been invited by a person who works for one of the uh, new uh, exploration companies. And it's all driven by lithium battery uh, market. And so any pegmatite that has a historical lithium mine or hints of lithium doesn't matter. Their companies are just grabbing land like you would not believe. And half of them don't even know what they're looking for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great talk. Thank you so much. Well, Mike, before you go, I just want to thank you because I was always in debt to uh, Kathy Repshaw and um, uh, um, Laura Dwyer for getting me down into the Moore field. <laughs> I was just into the hobby and I, I went down there and I was, you know, I saw them picking up the little chunks of Amazonite and stuff. And I thought, well, this is not really for me. I and, and then I saw Kathy in the gift shop with her hard hat and a light on her head. And I thought, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> So I was really lucky, and uh, now I'm in your debt because um, your name was used to get us down there. So well, Kathy owes me now. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but, but no, but to be honest, um, my personal feelings is that you really never you need that you you really never fully appreciate a pegmatite till you set foot in one, and it's one thing to go to one and collect. But to stop and actually look at it or have someone point things out to you, and then you begin, at least I would hope, you begin to realize just how special these rocks are. That, I mean, the the one up in Maine that has a giant spodumene, how many of you have been to a pegmatite where you can see a spodumene five feet long? And you sit there and you go, how does nature do that? And why don't all pegmatites do that? And why this particular one in Maine and not the ones, you know, 100 meters away from it? And that's the one thing that I that just fascinates me about these rocks is that it's never dull. There's always a surprise waiting to uncover itself. Uh, I'll never get bored with them. And unfortunately, I have to figure out a way how to be reincarnated so I can continue working on these things. I'm running out of time. I just wanted to mention, I don't know if you've, thank you, Michael, for a wonderful talk. And I just wanted to mention, have you been to the Navagador mine? No, I haven't. And um, the funny thing down there was that if somebody didn't know where something was from, people would automatically say the Navagador mine because yeah. everything was in there. So. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge place. I hope you get to go sometime. Well, yeah, I think in, in another lifetime I might. <laughs> There's so many places I want to go. Thank you very much, Mike. That was outstanding. Do we have any other questions for Mike before we go? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Sure. Hi. Um. All the my the where where people extract the topaz, the imperial topaz down in Brazil. Um. Mm -hmm. Are these pegmatites where the uh topaz crystals are? Yes, those big yeah. topaz from Brazil. Yes, they're definitely pegmatites. Okay. I mean, you can get you can get topaz from other types of rocks, like some of these rhyolites that we have in uh, Utah and in Mexico, but. The big giant topaz crystals, those are all pegmatite related. All pegmatite. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. One other question I had, um, which I think I will always have, is that uh, um, mine or whatever it is in Mexico with the giant, giant, giant crystal? Uh, the so you're thinking the cave of swords, selenite. Yeah, the ones that they call it the cave of the giants or something like that. Yeah, um, sword. cave of is, swords. Is that a pegmatite and is that accessible ever by human beings? Because from what I understand, the temperatures are pretty high there, so they <laughs> yeah. don't allow people to go in or something like that. Or I'm not sure I have the story correct. No, you're, you're right. There's really high temperatures and high humidity in that mine, and they don't allow... 
as far as I know, it's closed to general public and it's not a pegmatite. It's not a pegmatite. No, it's not. Even though it has giant crystals, it is not a pegmatite. It doesn't fit the mineralogy and the uh, the geologic processes under which they form to be considered. Do we know what it is, uh, the background the background for the formation of those crystals? How they came I'm, to be? I'm drawing a blank. Um, Oh God! A couple of years ago, I actually watched a video on it. I can't remember. Okay. Right. Okay. And and and, <clears throat> and you being um a, a pegmatite person, you don't have an interest to ever see that because they're not pegmatites. Out of curiosity. <laughs> uh well, I wouldn't say I don't have an interest, but I it's it's lower down on my list of things to really? see. Now. Oh my God! Okay. All right. Like I said, there's so many other pegmatites to see that I don't have time to look at other rocks. Yeah, it's just that because they are so gigantic from the way yeah. they oh, describe yeah. them. Yeah. I mean, if if I were if I were there, and someone goes, "Do you want to go see this?" And then, yeah, I would go, but okay. I wouldn't make at this point. I wouldn't make a special trip down there to go see them because, as I said, there's other places I want to look at other rocks, other places I want to look at pegmatites. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for Welcome. the amazing presentation and the excellent slides that you used. Thank you. So, Mike, do you take full credit for the Ten Commandments of Pegmatology? Do I take full credit? Yeah. Yes. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> I actually did that. I actually came up with that year, well, a couple of decades ago. And then I I found it in a set of old slides and go, let me update this and bring it back to life. Mike, who um, named the Don King tourmaline? Um, I can't say <laughs> for fear of getting sued. <laughs> I did. That is a great name. <laughs> I Every time I go to the Smithsonian, I just I, uh, I think it might have been both Paul Powat and I when we saw it, we first saw it. Good. And only out of curiosity, do you know what the price of that mine in Virginia with the Amazonite may be? Are you buying? <laughs> no, no, but I mean I'm wondering a place like that, what kind of value do people put? Uh, well, you know, value it it depends on what it's hard to say. I mean, I if I had to make a guess, and this is a guess, um, probably somewhere either between five hundred and seven hundred and fifty thousand okay. would be a guess. My guess, um, because it's not you know it's not a mine that produces great specimens. I mean, there are good things that come out of it. Um, you don't find Amazonite crystals like you do in Pikes Peak, Colorado. But they have found topaz crystals. They have found barrel crystals. They found, you know, tantalite crystals. So, you know, but it's, it's certainly of an educational, has an educational value. I mean, since Sam has had it, they've had hundreds of school kids from the local, from the area come there. Yeah, and it's you know there there's some future geologists here I know because of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean uh, that's the value of it, and it's uh, I mean it would be nice if a non-profit organization could step in and you know buy it like we preserve so many other things. You know. Yeah. The the one of the problems I see though is that if if someone were to do so, then you would want to be able to the develop it in a way that you could give underground tours. And that's not going to be a easy and it's going to be an expensive thing to do. Yeah. Because again, I, I would, personally speaking, I would love for people to see what it's like underground in place. Um, you know, it's just so different than any other pegmatite that you would visit. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to look for uh, my photos from that trip and I'll submit <clears throat> it to the next newsletter. Ken Rock, how about that? I will Mike, do this. I, always, uh, I, I, have, I have some great pictures. 
I was very fortunate. So yeah, you sir, I, I'm happy to use it in the newsletter. Let's do that, Kenny and, and Laura. Sounds good. Mike, when I, I always refer the kids, the school groups that come through the museum. I try to tell to get them interested in the big Amazonite uh, crystals on the display and curious and tell mm -hmm. them about uh, they can see what a green and white mine might yeah. look like by going up to the second floor. So even if because mm -hmm. when we were there, you, I, it, they would only allow adults down right. into yeah. the mine. Yeah. The kids can only go th through the tailings. Yeah. Um, but anyone can walk into the museum and experience what it would be like to be uh, in the Moorfield mine. Yeah, I mean, when I when we uh, put that diorama in, and Tim Rose had a lot to do with building, get that thing built for the hall. Um, you know, it was only a small snippet in the uh, from the Maya. I, you know, if I had my way and could have, I would have had a big green wall in there. With, but. We, we opted for trying to show some example of zoning within the pavement that, that included the Amazonite. Um, we did pretty good on that, Mike. Yeah, we did, Tim. We did so good that people tried to steal Amazonite out of it. What are they <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. When there was a in the in the diorama, there was a bag that Tim put together. And he he epoxy bits chunks of Amazonite to a wooden board, and we put it in this bag that came from the mine to give the impression that there was a bag full of Amazonite, and it was bolted to the back of the wall of the of the exhibit. And over years, we started noticing the bag was creeping forward to the front. Because people were reaching in there and trying to take the Amazonite. And finally, we just decided to, the exhibits decided to just remove the bag, which is unfortunate. But, but yeah, it's one of, I think it's one of the better exhibits um, in that gallery doing that Moorfield thing. Tim, Tim built a frame for that all. And it was, it was an art. Tim, do you still have, do you should still have the plans and steps to how you created that, don't you, somewhere? There are some uh, diagrams and whatnot. Um, but uh, basically what, what you see in that diorama is about 90% actual stone that yep. we mounted. And we had a wonderful, uh, person who knew all about making models of all kinds of materials, Carolyn Thome. And we would send off these uh, panels of real stone with like cracks and gaps between some of the some of the pieces. And it would come back and it would look like a slice out of the mine. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite a remarkable uh, diorama. And it does show the zoning of the pegmatite. Um, Anyway, it's just a little bit miniature. It's like one yeah. third size, something like that. But uh, it looks pretty much like the mine does, I think. Mm -hmm. So next time I volunteer in the museum, I'll go and take photographs of, of the museum mine. Okay, Kenny and <laughs> Laura, that'll be part of our <laughs> article. And give credit to Mike and Tim. <laughs> of course, of course. You know, it's yeah. funny. I, I owe a lot to the Smithsonian. Um, I would never have gotten into any of this if it wasn't for the Smithsonian. And uh, Jeff Cessna just sent me a text message asking, well, what about the Franklin Sterling Hill exhibit? I never would have. It's not pegmatite. No, it's not. <laughs> I don't but care. <laughs> I never would have gone there. And of course, now I'm a big Franklinite. So, um, yeah, I, I really do. I owe the Smithsonian a lot. And uh, I owe you and uh, Jeff Post and um, Tim Rose and everybody, um, Kathy, 
um, all the people that volunteer, Craig. So keep up the good work and uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, Mike.